Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal on this July 15th, 2015 day on our calendar. I'm your host, Greg Anthony. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. And you can catch my shows every evening, as long as they last, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. That's on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. That's Pacific Time. So set your clocks. And I've got some really interesting information today. This is part five of a series I'm calling In Search of the Great Ice Wall. And you'll find this quite fascinating. Uh, If you followed my other programs, oh, first I want to thank Nicholas, uh, the owner of this station, for putting up some uh, YouTube videos regarding this segment. And uh, I think really this is an important, uh, important topic. And the reason I've been dwelling on this is that it's the ultimate deception, and we live in this age of deception. And people say, well, hasn't uh, deception been uh, the old world order's uh, M.O. ever since the beginning of time? Uh, Beginning when we go back to Babylon, Egypt, and all those places? Well, yeah, but now it has really been refined because of technology. And they can do just about anything to mold our minds, our bodies, and souls. And the yesterday when I was playing, uh, I think his name was, uh, God, I can't remember right now. But anyway, you can go back to my show tomorrow. When I was playing his uh, information about the uh, flat or circle earth conspiracy history, we got to, we were looking at some old history, history dating back to uh, Babylon, Egypt, and back, uh, looking at how civilizations oh four or five thousand years ago were looking at the earth and um basically uh we ended he we, he got into nasa showing how uh it was begun by you know basically uh, m- m- some nazi uh, engine you know scientists were involved in this and we got to the point where he was talking about the vatican's connection to this so we got, uh, you know, and that kind of intersects with the research that I've done throughout the course of time. And the research basically uh, that I spent many, many years on was connecting the dots between the Vatican, our government, and what really the New World Order, or we can call it the Old World Order, is really all about. And so when we embark on this show, when we start looking at all the people that have found this stuff interesting uh, regarding the circle earth, whether the circle earth uh, theories have been covered up by NASA, have been covered up by the powers that be, uh, that's what we're out to prove. And what what I said yesterday on this show was that um, what we're looking at here is basically Uh, whether the earth is a globe, as we're told ever since we were in school, or whether it is a plane, a flat surface, uh, a circle, surrounded by a great ice wall. Now, I said yesterday, you're going to hear a lot of different things. Now, some of the things that come out of NASA, basically, is as uh, crazy as some other things you hear. But when you really look at things... You have to question this. Now, what I did is a few days ago, I set out in search of this ice wall. And uh, basically, <laughs> think maybe, you know, I told you the Coast Guard, the fishing game basically boarded my boat because uh, uh, they do that without probable cause. If you ever have a commercial fishing license, you'll find that out. So anyway, they board the boat. And... Uh, find out that I have a couple fish and no fishing license, so they escort me back, find me. And maybe that was a blessing in disguise, because as I was looking at, you know, maybe I was a bit impetuous, a bit uh, trying to prove a point without really thinking about uh, safety, things like that, and the type of of boat I was using. Uh, So what I decided to do, well, I was escorted back, and now I'm deciding whether to pay that fine or not. But... Uh, I want to look at today some of the explorers who basically uh, tried this before. Now, it's interesting that you don't hear about anything 
ever since Nassau got started. But back in the 1800s, 1700s, there were mariners that found this quite interesting. So what I'm going to do is relay some of this information to you and then kind of check out the boats they used and what we'd really need to do this. And I've put out some uh, queries regarding whether, hey, maybe there's somebody with a, uh, with a lot of money with a uh, idea of wanting to get to the bottom of this and uh, wants to help out. Or maybe we got some experts in, uh, uh, not, I'm by no means an expert in boat building, uh, what kind of really craft we'd need to do this safely. Uh, the boat I have, I'll, I'll explain it later, probably couldn't, uh, when you really think about it, it would be a, t it could make it, but uh, let's look at it a little closer since we're on land for these next two days. So what I want to do is go back and, you know, since we checked out some of the history of ancient civilizations talking about what our Earth was really about, I thought we'd look at today in part five of this series, some of the explorers that tried um, to tell us what the shape of our Earth really was. And let me be clear. We don't really know what's above us. What Nassau says is a lie. We don't know what is below us, and we've been told that we've gone eight miles down. And we don't really know what's... Uh, on the, you know, what's east, what's west, what's north, what's south. Now, the uh, topic that I'm discussing is basically looking at the Earth from a plane, looking at the North Pole from the center, center of our circle, and then an ice wall that surrounds everything. And if you look at a lot of them, you know, I've got a, uh, I called on some people with uh, math skills. Uh, we had to basically use trigonometry and uh, maybe a little over my head, but I've got something I want to play tomorrow, which will show that a sextant, for example, mariners in the old days used sextants to navigate, right? Now, how many people today know how to use one? Very few. They're not that expensive. Uh, well, it depends on your budget. Maybe you uh, can find, I found them around for three, four hundred dollars. Uh, but if you use a sextant, which I've done, and you try to measure the distance from the Earth to the Sun, you will find that it doesn't correlate with what the NASA tells us. They tell, they tell us, and they've told us many lies, and the recent one is that it's 93, what, million, billion miles away. Uh, when you check, it, check out a sextant, it's about 3,100 miles away and about 42 miles in circumference. So we got a sun that is definitely a lot closer than we think. Now, I called on somebody with some scientific skills, or excuse me, some math skills, and uh, they found the same thing out by doing trigonometry with a, an isosceles triangle, and we'll get to that maybe tomorrow. But let me get back to some of these explorers that uh, were navigating around this circle and what they found out. So we're going to go to this. Uh, it's about 26 minutes long, so we'll try to get it in today. And let me start it out right now. And uh, I always like to start out with some music. Hmm? And I'll turn it down so we can hear everything. But I'm looking at a group of penguins. And uh, I have questions whether this, that this may be at the North Pole. We don't really know. But we're going to get into some information. I'm looking at some pictures they have given us of Antarctica. Quite interesting. And let's relax a minute. Looks like a flat plane to me. What we're going to do is look at some of the explorers. Explorers who uh, set out to prove the shape of the Earth years, years before NASA was around to cover it up, spread the lies. 
and I thought this would be a good place to leave off from yesterday when we got to the point. Yeah, it was interesting because I said a long time ago, this story will resonate back to the Vatican as usual. And uh, let's go. And I'll make sure this is low enough so you hear me. In 1773, Captain Cook became the first modern explorer known to have breached the Antarctic Circle and reached the ice barrier. During three voyages lasting three years and eight days, Captain Cook and crew sailed a total, now listen to this, 60,000 miles along the Antarctic coastline, never once finding an inlet or path through or beyond the massive glacier wall. Now we never heard, what did Captain Cook write that we never get in our history books? He said this, the ice extends east and west, far beyond the reach of our sight, while the southern half of the horizon was illuminated by rays of light which were reflected from the ice to a considerable height, it was indeed my opinion that this ice extends quite to the pole, or perhaps joins some land to which it has been fixed since creation. Now we never see much of this in our history books, do we? But remember this, on October 5th, in 1839, another explorer, James Clark Ross, began a series of Antarctic voyages lasting a total of four years and five months, losing many men from hurricanes and icebergs, looking for an entry point beyond the southern glacier wall. You know, upon first confronting the massive barrier, Captain Ross wrote of the wall. And this is interesting. It extends from its eastern extreme point as far as the eye could discern. To the eastward, it presented an extraordinary appearance, gradually increasing in height as we got nearer to it, improving at length to be a perpendicular cliff of ice between 150 and 200 feet high above the level of the sea, perfectly flat and level at the top, and without any fissures or ways to enter into it. And on its seaward face, we might, with equal chance of success, try to sail through the cliffs of Dover is, is to penetrate such a mass. Amazing, huh? Now, how come we don't hear of any of this? Now, I'm looking at a picture provided. Amazing. Yes, but we can circumnavigate the South easily enough, as often said by those who don't know. The British ship Challenger recently completed the circuit of the southern region, indirectly to be sure, but she was, was three years about it and traversed 69,000 miles, a stretch long enough to have taken for six times around the glo globular hypotheses. Now, William Carpenter, he said that, 100 proofs the Earth is not a globe. Interesting. So why don't we hear more of Captain Cook? Now, Captain Scott, with Mr. Skelton and party, found a new route to the west and established a depot 2,000 feet up the glacier, 60 miles from the ship. On October 6th, now this is interesting, before NASA, of course, in 1903, one section of the explorers started for the strait in, in latitude 80s, and they found it contained a large glacial form from the inland ice and they obtained information as to the point of junction between the barrier ice and the land. A depot established the previous year was found to have moved a quarter of a mile to the north. Six of the party reached a point 160 miles southeast of the ship, traveling continuously over a level plain. There was no trace of land, no obstacles as in the ice were encountered, and evidence was obtained showing this vast plain 
to be afloat. Now, I guess we're going to have a big argument about icebergs right now. And when you go back to Cook and these explorers, really what they're telling us is that if you went in any direction and circled the earth, you will find this, whether you go west, east, northwest, northeast, and that is the information that I wanted to, uh, to bring to you today regarding what these earlier explorers found out. So, let's stop there for a minute and take a deep breath. It's a lot of information. And some of the questions that I've always asked were, how come we never heard about this? How come it's being covered up? And the Antarctic Treaty that we talk about discusses a lot of this. I mean, that's why 64 nations back in the 50s when Admiral Byrd went down there, an exploration that was basically uh, military, when he went, uh, guess what? Now no one can go in. 64 nations have formed a coalition, many who are supposedly at war, to keep us out. So here's what I'd like to do. Let's go back and uh, and look at the information. NASA we got are also yesterday. the same powers that run our historical institutions, governments, and modern religions. They are all sun occult practitioners. This is why the story was changed when books first started being made available to the public in the 15th and 16th centuries. Here we see the emblem of an Apollo mission with the sun most prominently displayed, with the sun god Apollo riding his chariot and horses to a much less prominent moon mission. NASA's history dates back to October 1st, 1958, when it was founded, and from the beginning in 25 years hence, one Verna Magnus Maximilian Ferra von Braun ran NASA's Saturn rocket program from the first Mercury missions through the alleged Apollo missions to the moon. Just as NASA was beginning to be developed to allegedly counter the Russians, who were said to be the first in space resulting in the great space race, Von Braun had plenty of time to go to Hollywood and collaborate with Paramount Pictures and Walt Disney to sell space travel to the public. Man of Space was the pre-programming of the public to accept vast sums of expenditures to counter the Cold War evil empire. It is common knowledge that before com coming to NASA, Von Braun was the wunderkind leader of the V-2 or Vengeant 2 rocket program for the Germans during World War II. According to a 2011 BBC documentary, the attacks resulted in the death of an estimated 9,000 civilians and military personnel, while 12,000 forced laborers and concentration camp prisoners were killed producing the weapons. As the V-2 or Vengeant weapon explosions came without warning, the British government initially attempted to conceal their cause by blaming them on defective gas mains. The English public was not fooled and soon became sardonically referring to the V-2s as flying gas pipes. The Germans themselves finally announced the V-2 on October or November 8, 1944, and only two days later did Winston Churchill inform Parliament and the world that England had been under a rocket attack for the last few weeks, unquote. After these deadly results, British intelligence leaked falsified information implying that the rockets were overshooting their London targets by 10 to 20 miles. Von Braun entered the U.S. illegally through military and U.S. government channels, mm. along with hundreds of other German known Nazis after World War II, with the help of Vatican issued passports, where they followed the so called Vatican rat lines down to South America and then into the U.S. under Operation Paperclip in the early 1950s. Operation Paperclip was the Office of Strategic Services predecessor to the CIA's program, used to recruit the scientists of Nazi Germany for employment by the United States in the aftermath of World War II. To circumvent President Truman's anti-Nazi order in the Allied Potsdam and the Alta Agreement, the JIOA worked independently to create false employment and political biographies for the scientists. They also expunged the public record of the scientists' Nazi party memberships and regime affiliations. Also included in Operation Paperclip was the bringing over to the U.S. J.D. Rockefeller-funded eugenicists like medical scientists Walter Schreiber, Kurt Blum, Herbata Strughold, and Hans Ottmann. The so-called father of space medicine, Herbata Strughold, was said to be one of the 13 people who participated in the Dachau concentration camp experiments. 
He was known to have been working on the infamous hypothermia or cold experiments, which exposed prisoners to freezing conditions to see how long it took them to die under such conditions, and if it was possible to be revived. The results obtained from torturing the inmates in concentration camps are used today by doctors to treat hypothermic patients. Further, irony is that the U.S. even currently has a Herbetus Drughold Award given out by the American Space Medicine Association for superior space medical achievements. Kurt Blom was a high-ranking Nazi who served as the Deputy Health Minister to the Third Reich and researched bat bacteriological warfare using cancer research as his official camouflage. Bloom was fascinated by the use of carcinogenic agents and can cancer-causing viruses. He ran a Nazi biological warfare program codenamed Blitzebleiter, which means lightning rod. Bloom's institute was therefore a camouflage operation for the production of biological warfare agents. He also exposed prisoners in Auschwitz to sarin gas, mm -hmm. which is a nerve agent that is classified as a weapon of mass destruction. Three years later, Bloom was tried at the Nuremberg Trials for Euthanasia in Human Experiments experimentation, but was acquitted by U.S. Army intelligence. In order for Blum to qualify for admittance in America under President Truman's jurisdiction, military officials withheld incriminating evidence that demonstrated his role as the supervisor of such horrific experiments. We need to take a sidebar here before leaving the World War II time frame. To be very clear, for 500 years we've been trained and taught in schools and by government historical agencies to believe certain stories of history that the hidden occult powers want you to believe. History, it is said, is told by the winners in war, and there have been a war on for the minds of all since the times of Alexandria when the Romans burned the greatest libraries of all time, followed in history by the Roman Catholic Vatican effectively purging any heretics who refused their religious doctrines and burned at the stake and worst as examples to anyone who spoke out otherwise during the hundreds of years of the Dark Ages. The official story is that Adolf Hitler and all Nazis were horrible mass murderers, when, when much evidence is now available suggesting in reality he was onto the hidden occult power and agenda, dressed up as a capitalistic democracy, and was in reality attempting to build a nation free from New World Order controls. One of his first actions in power was to remove the occultists from Germany. Just ask, ask yourself for a moment, why did so many so willingly and happily join Hitler? What reasons could he have possibly given to his people that would have made them give their lives so willingly? Truth be told, Rockefeller's standard oil of New Jersey provided critical no-knock additives so the German airplanes could fly. IBM is said to have provided the computers to account for POWs in the German camps. Coca-Cola sold their drinks under Fanta in Germany, and major facilities like the IG Farben plants were spared by Allied bombings during the war. Okay, so what we're doing is taking a little aside here and trying to, uh, trying to uh, connect the dots because many people ask me when I do this story about the Circle Earth, uh, what does it have to do with what you normally talk about, and that is Vatican intrigue, and I say it has a lot to do with it because of what uh, this gentleman's telling you uh, is things I've uttered on this show for many, many years, and that is we have to look at this as a complete deception from beginning to end, whether we talk about wars, whether we talk about science, education, uh, and what we're doing is showing that we don't even know what we stand on, and I'm talking about what your feet are standing on right now on this, on this earth, because of the deception. And NASA spends billions of dollars to do that. And I think it's just about time we proved them wrong. And there are so many people now catching on. It's amazing. Uh, so we'll continue with this in the next half hour on the Investigative Journal. Back in three minutes. <laughs> Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, 
Don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, the rapture will be canceled. That's crossthborder.org. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver, Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188, toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, welcome back to the second half hour of the Investigative Journal. And um, I think what we'll do is we'll continue on. This is part five of In Search of the Great Ice Wall. And we'll continue on with trying to connect some of the dots between uh, how this uh, final, the ultimate deception, was created. Who's behind it? It's the same people that are behind 9-11. It's the same people who are behind the Vatican rat lines. And all of these people, the spiritual and the secular powers that be, we call them the New World Order, but they're actually the Old World Order, are working together. They formed NASA through uh, bringing over Nazi scientists. So if you think that the wars weren't orchestrated, think again. So we'll continue on with that today. Uh, but tomorrow I've got some real science, I got some mathematical information that will show you the distance of the sun to our planet and why, you know, uh, <laughs> these geniuses at NASA, if they don't know a little common trigonometry, then what do they know? The point I'm trying to make is all of their science is unproven and false as a cover up to what we really should know about this earth. Let's get back to uh, what we were doing in the last half hour, and tomorrow we'll get on with some of that uh, and more on some of the explorations back in the 17 and 18 and 1900s. Thank you. The number of six million Jews said to have been exterminated in what has been known as the only Holocaust number has been used by the Zionist and bankster, banksters behind the scenes that finance both sides of World War I and II for decades of propaganda now. The Russians apparently were set to massacre six million Jews. How coincidental. This story now has been debunked, yet official history fails to correct or rectify this growth untruth. As physical evidence comes to light to disprove these ingrained in history numbers, the official narrative had to begrudgingly be corrected. In 1989, Auschwitz corrected its monuments and reduced the number of deaths from four million to 1.1 million based on overwhelming evidence that could no longer be hidden, yet the six million total never changed. According to official records directly after World War II, the International Red Cross and detailed German death records indicate that only 150,000 died at Auschwitz, 
of whom 30,000 were Jews, not millions. Where's the academia historians at our major universities correcting this gross error in newly revised historical fact? It is still illegal in some European countries to even question the official narrative of the Holocaust hoax. The facts are that throughout World War II and after the war, the U.S. and Great Britain were completely aligned with Uncle Joe Stalin, who during his reign of terror murdered between 20 to 50 million of his own people. Yet you never hear about this. This was with full knowledge and complicity of the U.S. government and military officials. The term Holodomor refers specifically to the brutal artificial famine imposed by Stalin's regime on Soviet Ukraine and primarily ethnically Ukrainian areas in northern Caucasus in 1932 to 33. In 1945, General Dwight Eisenhower ordered that Operation Keyhole be put into effect. This involved the rounding up and shipping back to their countries of origin all the refugees from communism, men, women, and children, soldier and civilian, male and female, even though many of them had been fighting on our side during the war. Since all of Eastern Europe was then under communist domination, sending these people back was quite literally a sentence of death some by immediate ex execution, and the rest by slow extermination from overwork and malnutrition in the Soviet slave labor camps in Siberia. These people were rounded up at bayonet point and forced into freight cars and shipped off to their terrible fate. There was no accurate count kept, but the min minimum figure was 2 million people and the maximum of 5 million people. After the war, millions more Germans died by starvation and disease in a ruined society, and one and a half million German soldiers died in Eisenhower's Andersonville-like death camps under the infamous and barbarous Morgenthau Baruch plans. The recent book Hellstorm by Thomas Goodrich is a must-read and tells the revisionist history of the U.S. directly involvement after World War II. The book lays out vividly and in great detail how the U.S. and specifically General Dwight D. Eisenhower reclassified some 1.2 million captured German POWs from POW to DEF, which stood for Detained Enemy Forces. The reason was so that he could get around having to provide food and medical aid to German prisoners as was required by the International Red Cross and the U.S.-created Geneva Convention. Today we see the same banksters backed by Zionists in our Congress making unveiled threats of mass destruction and a very, very large mirror is needed to shine light on who really is and has been the bad guys for centuries. So let's get back to the beginnings of NASA in 1958 where every photo and every story of space exploration has come from for over the past 50 years. The first NASA administrator in 1958 was Dr. Thomas Keith Glennon. Previously to NASA, he was the studio manager for 10 years at Paramount Studios in Hollywood. Then from 1942 to 47, he was the administrator and director of the U.S. Naval Underwater Sound Laboratory, and then after the war was production manager for the photographic film manufacturing company ANSCO, also known as GAF. His work in movie making and underwater photography came in handy to fake the Apollo moon missions and spacewalks. Here is the massive underwater neutral buoyancy laboratory in Houston, Texas, which is said to facilitate astronauts with near weightlessness in space, but has actually has been used for decades to facilitate fake space moon footage. Besides computer generated imaging techniques and underwater photography, the other way NASA simulates missions is through zero gravity planes. Once airborne and on a parabolic arc, weightlessness is created. Here in his alleged video of astronauts in the space shuttle up in space 130 miles floating around freely in zero weight gravity. Note how you can clearly see the crotch climbing harnesses around the astronauts as well as a shoulder harness in the bulk of their shirts. NASA can hide the wires but cannot hide the obvious suspension apparatuses that allows them to flip and float about. This technology has been around since the beginning of the alleged space race, as can be seen from this footage from a Russian documentary about space travel made in 1957. This is just one more example of what we are, sh are shown today has exist existed in secret much longer than we are told. No, Hollywood has been used to pre-program the public 
to accept certain future realities as the occult elite wish us to see and believe. Here we see an episode from 1966 of Star Trek TV using many of the devices we use today that were unknown or unheard of back in 1966. seeing many of the computer devices, large screen TVs, all the things that we have now, cell phones, used during Star Trek, also weightlessness, many, many other things. I wonder what Spock really knows. And Captain Kirk. <laughs> He's still around. I think he makes uh, commercials now. They even had wireless earpieces back then I'm looking at exactly what they were doing. Pre-planning what we have today. They had tablet digital systems. So folks, when we can understand that Hollywood and NASA work together. Entertainment is entertainment is mental containment. <laughs> Trivia buffs should love the fact that Lieutenant Uhura of Star Trek fame, Nichelle Nichols, then went on to be a chief recruiter for NASA of the alleged astronauts in the late 1970s into the late 1980s. Her recruits included the first African-American astronaut, Sally Ride, the first female astronaut, and Judith Resnick, who was alleged to have perished during the launch of the Challenger on January 28, 1986. We accept CGI, or computer-generated imaging, of movies like the recent Clooney-Bullock collaboration of the space film Gravity as being created in Hollywood, yet how hard would it be to fake NASA footage as well from sp uh, the space station with yesterday and today's CGI capabilities? Fortunately, digital photo analysis advanced, so going back to official NASA photos, like this one of the alleged round ball Earth, shows many duplications that have, could not have possibly occurred were a real photograph taken from space. And does anyone seem to care that for over two decades now, we are always seeing the exact same photograph of Earth? Secret societies have been part of the occult or hidden hand of preserving the great lie since the beginning. How cool or powerful it would be for secret societies' recruiting purposes if you could tell your new first three-degree blue members that Buzz Aldrin, the second man we are sold had stepped on the moon, had planted a Scottish Rite Freemason flag on there. From George Washington and his laying of the cornerstones of the White House to many U.S. presidents like Harry S. Truman, many have been Freemasons. So to fake an Apollo moon landing... One Kenneth or Kenny S. Kleinecht managed, managed the Apollo space missions from the beginning until retiring to Lockheed Corp. in 1981. He was a 33-degree Mason, and for his great work at NASA and the Apollo fake moon missions, he then became the sovereign grand commander and titular head of all Scottish Rite Masons throughout the world. Make no mistake, the powers that run NASA are co-joined, run, and controlled by the military and secret societies of the New World Order, and always have been in modern times. Using Hollywood, whose name comes from the holly tree used by the ancient druids for black magic, as well as known celebrities to promote their sun-worshipping Horus snake ways, as they show off their serpent tongues to mock those without eyes to see or ears to hear the hidden truth about what is really going on in our world today. Up until December of 2014, no books had been written for some 70 years as the flat plane earth theory. It was during the mid-1850s an independent free-thinking gentleman and intellectual named Samuel Robotham traveled tire tirelessly for 30 years around Europe to teach flat earth theory to anyone that would listen. He wrote the book Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe, 
as well as began the International Flat Earth Research Society. Zetetic comes from the Greek language meaning to proceed by inquiry and or investigation. Following his death, Lady Elizabeth Blount, wife of explorer Sir Walter de Soddington Blount, established the Universal Zetetic Society. The society published a magazine, The Earth Not a Globe Review, and remained active well into the 20th century. William Carpenter continued on with Rowlatton's work as well. Mr. Carpenter pu published The Theoretical Astronomy Examined and Exposed, Proving the Earth Not a Globe in Eight Parts in 1864, under the name Common Sense. He later emigrated to Baltimore, where he published 100 Proofs the Earth is Not a Globe in 1885. In 1901, David Wardlaw Scott published Terra Firma, The Earth Not a Planet, provided from scripture, reason, and fact. In the United States, as Einstein's theory of relativity was beginning to be promoted as scientific genius by the Royal Society of London, a very brave and intelligent man named Ger Gerard Hickson took to the task to debunk the modern astronomers' heliocentric theories from Copernicus to Einstein. In his excellent little-known book, Kings Dethroned, he matter-of-factly proves the mathematical flaws and erroneous assumptions built upon when inventive theory made the preposition that the Earth was a sphere and not a flat and rotated around the sun and was not Earth-centric. This is a must-read for anyone to truly understand how science and astronomy has got it so wrong for so long. Mm. He was followed by Wilbur Voliva, who preached their flat Earth science in Zion, Illinois for over a decade, until the first space launches in the late 1950s and early 60s appeared to prove flat earth theorists wrong, yet he continued to believe in and preach the flat earth cosmology. In 1956, Samuel Shenton started the Flat Earth Society, and he too spent many years traveling around Europe, convincingly teaching flat earth theory despite tremendous ridicule and scorn from newspapers, yet rarely losing an argument to round ball heliocentric arguments and alleged proofs. In the 1970s, across the pond, Charles and Marjorie Johnson took up the cause and determined to follow on Mr. Shenton's work, they published the Flat Earth News. Suspiciously, their home was burned down by an arsonist, and all their research and documentation, as well as their historical rep records, were lost in the fire. Sadly, Marjorie died shortly thereafter, and Charles died homeless and poor. Yet now, some 40 years later, a 30-something Eric Dubai has revived the conversation as to facts and myths of heliocentrism versus geocentrism. In his must-read book, Flat Earth Conspiracy, published in December, he emphatically proves viable evidence of a flat Earth as well as showing evidence of 500 years of a globalist conspiracy. Okay, I'm going to break in here for a second while we uh, go back into history and look at some of the people that were trying to tell us what uh, the earth, the shape of the earth that we lived on, what it really was. Now, I want to mention that some of the names mentioned here, we're going to, we're going to embark on a, a little a test, really, as we look into this movement today and see who's on the good side, who's on the bad side, so to speak, as we, as we do in most all other truth movements uh, on this show. And like I say, it's difficult to tell, but you can learn from all of them. And the question and the answer really is, do you understand who's on the good side, who's on the bad side? And at that point, you can listen to all of them. And let's get back. You're going to or from. But if the Earth was actually spinning at the rate that they say it was, flight times would be totally different. Hmm. It makes sense, but yet I've been taught from an early age not to trust myself because they've got it on lock, so I just assume that the, the physics all kind of works out. But I know there are people who go to school for physics. You know, they study it for years and years, and it's just odd that none of them ever catch on to it, that I guess that guys like Newton created this entire fake science around a fake model, and yet all the math checks out. That's a little hard for me to rectify. Well, they're counting on that. That's why they've got all these huge <laughs> formulas and calculations for gravity and whatnot that are based on nothing. So, like, they've got a weight for the baller all based on their gravity calculations. Science is designed exactly how economics and taxes are designed. The increasing complexity makes it so the average individual just has to trust the experts. You can follow it to a certain point, but then most people say, well... That's a little bit beyond me, but there's experts out there. They know what they're doing. Um, I'm sure that 
this fractional reserve banking system, this debt-based system of rule is just fine. <laughs> you know, um, I'm sure the taxes I'm paying are totally fair. They've got the code. They got the big book. You know, they wouldn't overcharge me. They wouldn't, you know, pull any scams on me. And you could apply the same thing to, of course, science. But it's just to what degree? This is a really far out degree. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, our eyes and experience tell us the earth is flat and motionless and everything in the sky revolves around us. But when we cease to believe our own eyes and experience, we have to prostrate ourselves at the feet of these very pseudo scientists who are blinding us, treat them as experts, astronomical priests who have special knowledge only they can access, like the Hubble telescope. So by brainwashing us of something so gigantic and fundamental, it actually makes every other kind of lesser indoctrination a piece of cake. <laughs> Earth being the flat, fixed center of the universe around which everything in the heavens revolves gives a special importance and significance not only to Earth, but to us humans, the most intelligent among the intelligent designers' designs. By turning Earth into a spinning ball thrown around the sun and shot through infinite space from a godless Big Bang, they turn humanity into a random, meaningless, purposeless accident of a blind, dumb universe. Mm -hmm. So it's like trauma-based mind control beating the divinity out of us with their mental manipulation. Okay, now this is Eric Dubai speaking. Now, when you look into the Flat Earth movement today, there's a lot of people out there that are catching on to what's going on. The question becomes, who are the COINTEL people and who aren't? Now, let me tell you, I'm not an expert in this, but I've learned to uh, look at the signs and symbols of this. Uh, having worked uh, on Genesis in the old days, with, with the station where Alex Jones is on, I believe my show was on right after him, being interviewed by him many times, Jeff Rents. Oh, then I moved over and I was also on RBN, so I had an idea uh, when I figured out who these people were. Uh, what they were up to. And one of the litmus tests I always use is uh, getting to the bottom of the Vatican. And that's a good way to look at this. Now, I've also found out that uh, there are people that who discuss and talk against the Vatican are also working with them. And that's an old Jesuit ploy that they've used for years. And the point uh, I'm trying to make is I've learned in the beginning I was kind of antagonistic towards these people. But what I figured out after, and after thinking about it and working, is that you can gain a lot of information and keep the lines of communication open with these guys, which in the beginning I didn't. But, you know, we live and learn. But the only question you have to answer is who's on what side and then you'll get the idea and be able to sort and the real key is to sort out the information who cares who they are just know when they're leading you down the wrong rabbit hole or trying to discredit a movement and maybe I'll do a show on that because I, I learned all about this when I was uh, trying to get to the bottom of 9-11 but let's get back to uh, the intro to the flat earth history research and conspiracy uh, people are always asking, you know, why do they do this? I mean, this is, I mean, other than the obvious profit margin motive, NASA being the biggest black budget black hole in existence, sucking in over $30 billion taxpayer money for the fake moon landings alone. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, hundreds of billions of dollars, and not just NASA, but RASA and all the other fake space organizations around the world giving CGI images for hundreds of billions of dollars. So this modern atheist Big Bang heliocentric globe Earth chance evolution paradigm spiritually controls humanity by removing God or any sort of intelligent design and replaces purposeful divine creation with haphazard random cosmic coincidence. And so by removing Earth from the motionless center of the universe, these masons have moved us physically and metaphysically from a place of supreme importance to one of complete nihilistic indifference. If the Earth is the center of the universe, then the ideas of God, creation, and a purpose for human existence are resplendent. But if the Earth is just one of billions of planets revolving around billions of stars and billions of galaxies, then the ideas of God, creation, and a specific purpose for Earth and human existence become highly implausible. 
so by surreptitiously indoctrinating us into their scientific materialist sun worship not only do we lose faith in anything beyond the material we gain absolute faith in materiality superficiality status selfishness hedonism and consumerism if there's no god and everyone's just an accident then all that really matters is me 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 <laughs> so they've turned madonna and the mother of god into a, the material girl living in a material world their rich powerful corporations with their slick sun cult logos sell us idols to worship slowly taking over the world while we tacitly believe their science vote okay now that sounds pretty good that was eric dubai and uh, some are out there calling him a cointel and others uh, and he's calling a bunch of other people that so uh let's uh, let's understand though you can get some good things out of uh what he's saying no matter who he is and the real point is we're trying to determine what the shape of the earth is, what's above us, and what's on the sides of us, if it's a circle, and what's in the earth. And uh, there's a lot of questions. I can categorically say the earth is not a sphere, but I don't know what's above it, and I don't really know what's on the other side of those ice walls. That's what we're trying to look at. And so use that information, you know, use that kind of, oh, what would I call it, a... Uh, a light in the darkness to keep you going in a good path to get to this information. Now, there's going to be a lot of people that will present a lot of crazy ideas, and that's done to discredit without really knowing what's there. So they, they do that in many, many different uh, truth movements. So uh, let's see how much time we got. We're going to come back to this subject again tomorrow for part six. We're all out of time. Have a good evening and good night.